All right, everybody, welcome to Overwrite, the podcast that features your fiction. Today we have our very first story, and I'm so excited to share it. This is The Poisoning of Mary Grace, written by Kristen Hart of Iowa. You can find her on Twitter at KristenHart11. One fun fact about Kristen comes from her son. He said that she is the best mom in the history of the world. All right, enjoy this story from Kristen. It's a very fun adventure in less than a thousand words. Here we go. The Poisoning of Mary Grace by Kristen Hart. Excuse me. Hello? Uh, Can you please... A woman stood at the end of an alley. Towering buildings stood on either side of her. People rushed by on their way to work. Or maybe it was on their way home from work. She searched her mind to remember what time of day it was, but came up blank. Everyone seemed to be too busy to stop and help. She wondered for a bit, hoping to see something that would jog her memory. She had no recollection of how she got there or who she even was. She sat on a bench and tried to figure out what to do next when a young man approached. I'm sorry, I know this might sound strange, but do you know where we are? He asked, sitting down next to her. She shook her head. I'm sorry, I don't know either. Panic began to rise in her again. Was there a reason she couldn't seem to remember anything, only to find a boy in the same predicament? The young man's hazel eyes widened. Do you... He bit his lip before continuing. I can't remember anything before a few minutes ago. I can't either. I was beginning to think I was crazy. Do you think it's a virus? Some sort of chemical warfare? Everyone else seems to be fine. She gestured to the people passing by on the sidewalk. I'm not sure, the young man said. Where were you when you, I guess, woke up? Maybe we could retrace your steps. I was at the end of an alley. I think I could find my way back, she said. They rose from the bench and began to walk. Do you think we hit our head? She asked him. Both of us? Both resulting in memory loss? My head feels fine. What about you? Mine feels fine too. She felt deflated as she searched for more ideas. They turned down a street that she thought she recognized. She pointed to a point between two buildings. There. I was standing right there. It felt like waking from a trance. I was standing right here when I woke up, he told her. Do you remember seeing anything weird right after it happened? He shook his head. No, everything except me seemed normal. Let's walk over to the alley and see if we can find anything. As they came upon the alley, the man walked ahead of her as if assessing the scene for danger and trying to protect her. He walked in the alley, leaving her at the entrance. He stopped on the other side of a dumpster and froze, face twisted in horror. Is everything okay? She called to him. I, I think you need to come see this for yourself, the young man stammered. She trudged towards him, frightened of what she might see. Slumped against the other side of the dumpster was a body of a young woman. She was clearly dead, as there was an absence of the rise and fall of her chest, and while her eyes remained open, they held no life. The woman looked back to the young man, unsure of what she should do. It's you. How is it you? He stammered as he began to back away. Fear gripped her when she looked at the young woman, then down at herself. They were wearing the same red shirt and the same dark jeans. A window that she hadn't noticed before was positioned before her. Where she should have seen her wide-eyed reflection, she saw nothing, except the other side of the alley, and the reflection of the petrified young man. She felt an overwhelming pull towards the body and collapsed to the ground in front of the young woman. As she kneeled in front of the body, trying to pull air into her lungs, she noticed a small slip of paper on the ground next to her. She picked it up and unfolded the note. The antidote will be in his pocket. You will need to find him. Mary Grace. Search your pocket, she yelled to the young man. What? Just do it, she screamed at him. That seemed to break him of his paralysis. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small vial. Where did you get that? She asked him, suspicion clear in her voice. 
I didn't even know it was there until you asked me about it. Give it to me. He stepped towards her. No, don't give it to me. Give it to the dead me, she demanded. He slowly bent down in front of the body and poured the liquid from the vial into the body's open mouth. The body began to shake, and the woman felt herself being pulled towards the body and started melting into it. Her lungs began to fill again, and memories started to flood her mind. She felt whole again. A car screeched to a halt at the end of the alley. An old man stuck his head out of the open driver's window. Mary Grace, you found the antidote. Get in the car. The young man looked back and forth between Mary Grace and the newcomer. What's going on? I still don't get any of this. What happened to you? How did I get that vial? I'll explain everything when we get there, Kyle. Just get in the car before they find us again. All right. I hope you enjoyed. I know I did. Thank you so much for listening in. Don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss out on the rest of this week's adventures with Mary Grace. Thanks for listening to Overwrite, and we will see you soon. All right, everybody, welcome back to Overwrite, the podcast that features your fiction. Today's version of The Poisoning of Mary Grace is by author Marcus Mutra of California. You can follow him on his Amazon author page at Marcus Mutra, and he wants you to know one fun fact about him is that he loves to paint. All right, let's see what he did with this story. The Poisoning of Mary Grace by Marcus Mutra Who was Mary Grace? Mary Grace appeared to be a sweet southern belle, with blue eyes that sparkled like the ocean, and brunette hair that shined in the sunlight and the moonlight. She was someone who would smile, wave, and speak to everyone who made eye contact with her. Men, and even women, would nearly break their necks whenever she walked by because she exuded beauty and elegance. She had the body of an hourglass and strutted with confidence in her red-bottomed heels. Men wanted to be with her, and women wanted to be her. Needless to say, everyone in the small town knew her, or at least of her. Thus, it's hard to say who could have poisoned Mary Grace, because she seemed to be nice to everyone in the town. Not to mention, it wasn't like she lived there long enough to make enemies. She had just moved in three weeks ago. When word spread that her neighbor Genevieve had found her lying lifeless on the living room floor, the people of the town began to wonder who could have done something this sinister to her. What if the Mary Grace they got to know was only for show? What was Mary Grace like before she had moved to sweet little Georgia Oaks? You see, no one who lived in Georgia Oaks knew who Mary Grace really was. All they knew about her was what she told them. She moved to the small town by herself, and she hardly spoke about her family. The first day of the investigation, the detectives integrated Genevieve because she was the one who had found Mary. Genevieve told the detectives that Mary's door was unlocked, which was common in this small town. No one had a reason to lock their doors because the crime rate was literally zero. Well, unless you want to count people stealing things from the local market. But murder wasn't something this town had ever faced before. Nevertheless, Genevieve told her story. She said she called Mary's name just to let her know before she walked into the house. But Mary didn't answer. Genevieve thought to herself, Well, maybe she's using the bathroom. Mary was certainly home because her car was in the driveway and her coat and purse were hanging on the rack by the front door. Genevieve then sauntered down the small aisle, past the steps that led to the living room. When Genevieve reached the end of the aisle and turned to the right, she saw Mary lying face down on the living room floor. She screamed, Mary, repeatedly, and then rushed over to her. Her knees hit the floor, and then she turned Mary over to check her pulse, but she felt nothing. She flipped Mary onto her back and was about to give a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But that's when she noticed a foaming residue on Mary's lips. 
That's when Genevieve realized mouth to mouth would be useless because someone had poisoned her neighbor. And that's when she dialed 911. During the autopsy, it determined that Mary was, in fact, poisoned. But everyone in the town was still wondering how and by whom. When Genevieve found Mary on the floor, she didn't see any broken glass next to her, so her drinking something and then instantly falling to her death was out of the question. She also didn't see any food or plates covered in crumbs sitting on the coffee table. Maybe the murderer played it safe, and he or she had injected Mary with a needle. After thoroughly checking Mary's body from head to toe, there was no sign of bruises or another human's hair follicle or fingerprints on her body. They even checked to see if she had been intimate with a man before her death. But nope, there was no sign of a man either. Some townsfolk started thinking, well, what if she killed herself and threw the substance in the trash? The investigators even checked her outside trash cans and found nothing. Two days had flown by and there was no clue about who poisoned Mary. The investigators could say a ghost had killed her and everyone would believe it. Since Mary had no family living in the town, they figured it was time to call off the case. The townsfolk had ruled to have a small funeral for Mary because she had become family to them. What people don't know about Mary is that she isn't human. She moves from town to town only to gain people's trust before faking her death. Mary Grace can't die because she's immortal. She lives by feeding on innocent souls, and one was her neighbor Genevieve. Oh, so you thought Genevieve was the one talking to the investigators? Nope. It was Mary the entire time. Mary had invited Genevieve over for what Genevieve thought would be tea and to spill the tea. But that wasn't the case. Instead, Mary drained the life out of Genevieve and then used a spell to switch their bodies. Now, Mary walks around Georgia Oaks as Genevieve, scoping out her next victim. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on tomorrow's final version of this story. And I'll see you then. Hello and welcome back to Overwrite, the podcast that features your fiction. Today is our last day with Mary Grace. And today's story is by Jason Patton of Colorado. Let's go right to it. The Poisoning of Mary Grace by Jason Patton Lieutenant Mary Grace Presley never thought the day would come when she would step into one of the world's most advanced submarines, the Seawolf class. The Seawolf had nuclear propulsion, a deep diving capability, powerful sonar, and long-range guided weapons. But the most powerful part of the submarine is her crew. To be assigned to this incredible piece of engineering, A soldier had to be the top of her or his class. Lieutenant Presley fought tooth and nail to be there. She stayed up late at night and skipped going out on holidays after being stuck in her room for weeks on end. She dreamed of exam preps, of maps, of celestial navigation. She even survived being poisoned. In the dining hall, she had seen the Navy Times newspaper and read about the first female passing ranger school. Inspiring was an understatement. Ranger school was one of the most challenging courses in human history. It took soldiers to the limit of human capability. It truly required strength. But what many do not know is that it requires mental strength more than physical. Lieutenant Presley knew that she had that strength, and she could not smile without thinking of her father, a man who always pushed her, who raised her to be strong and never waste a second. Even though, as a child or teenager, most kids resent growing up in an environment like that, they later realize, as Lieutenant Presley did in that dining hall, 
that a father can look at a child like a rocket shooting into space, filled with anxiety about it leaving and, hopefully, making it past the hardships so it can soar. He always knew Mary Grace would soar. Life has its gravities that hold the rocket to Earth, and Mary Grace knew. Sometimes, cancer takes it all, and it might have taken her father, like many fathers, but his fire and love lived deep inside her soul. That is why she always knew she had to make it. People take the time to prepare, to avoid obstacles, but life tends to move at such a speed that the word control is almost laughable. Mary Grace had daily habits, and one was coffee. She loved coffee. She would go into her favorite coffee shop and order a small cup of Guatemalan single-origin coffee. That day, she stood in line and smiled because the final engineering exam was tomorrow, and she felt confident. She had put in her time to prepare. She got her coffee and enjoyed it. Pranks, mischief, hate, and plain evil are all part of this world. Humans have had to deal with this forever, but timing can sometimes be the worst part of it. Someone across the world chose to lace the coffee beans of a few shipments with chemicals and drugs. On that day, Lieutenant Presley drank her coffee from that batch. It is easy to say that situations can be fixed and tests can be rescheduled, but time can't be wound back. In the Navy, slots are filled. They are not held or postponed for an individual. When a slot for an aircraft carrier or submarine comes, it fills for that year and that slot. It is gone. It does not wait. It is a logical system, a system designed to place the best people available at the time. After finishing her coffee, Mary Grace started to drive back to base. She yawned and looked down at her right hand, which was trembling. As she tried to understand why her hand was trembling, her eyes went from seeing one steering wheel to four and back again. When Mary Grace woke up, she was in a hospital bed. She pressed the nurse call button, and a nurse by the name of Daniel came in and filled in the gaps in her timeline. Mary Grace had gone into a seizure, and her car went into a ditch. They rushed her to the hospital, where they pumped her stomach. Her coffee was laced with a cocktail of meth and heroin, a combination that is poisonous, to say the least. Mary Grace never felt like she did at that point. Her mind was slow, her body weak, and she had a hard time staying awake. The doctor said she needed to stay a few days for observation. Is it weak to cry? Is it weak to feel emotion? Mary Grace did not feel that way. As she cried, she felt not her body, but her mind and soul light up like the start of a fire. The small flames glowed and searched for air. The fire wanted to ignite. Her body almost quit. Her mind fought for her body, and she knew she had it in her to push just that little bit harder. When the nurse offered to give her a sleep aid or a pain reliever, Mary Grace declined. She asked if they had her phone, and they said it was not found at the time she was rescued. She had no way to set an alarm, so Mary Grace closed her eyes and rested, but never slept. At 6 a.m., she walked out of the hospital. She didn't check out or pick up discharge papers, and, thankfully, a few taxis were waiting outside the hospital. During the drive to the base, Mary Grace looked out the window, drawing strength. She got home, slowly got into her uniform, and went to the exam room. When she walked into the bright room, people were talking and had the energy a room full of candidates would have. The instructor called everyone to their seats and, as Lieutenant Presley sat down, for a brief moment, she smiled. It was not a smile of success or a smile of happiness, but a smile that she was strong. Lieutenant Presley always knew her father would be proud, but this time she felt his hand on her shoulder and she knew she had made it to the stars. Thank you so much for listening in. I hope you have enjoyed these stories about Mary Grace. Check back in tomorrow to find out the details of the next prompt.